Hello, I'm Bill Kirkland, volunteer and member of Hurricane Community Church. I'd like to welcome you uh, whenever you're watching this online edition of our worship experience. Glad you're here, and I hope you'll make this a habit. Uh, I want to draw a few things to your attention. As you can see, I'm standing in front of the uh, bulletin board that is out in the uh, hall, main hallway of the church. I want to draw your attention to uh, the community partners that uh, um, we help with. One of them is uh, Kick It. And if you need information about how you can volunteer with Kick It, just go to this uh, bulletin board in the hallway and it'll just, it'll just tell you. And I noticed in the paper this morning uh, that they are doing a food collection uh, that I think is going to be this coming Monday, the 16th. So if you're interested in helping kick it, uh, take some non-perishable food items to their location and, uh, and help, out, help load the truck for that. They help a, a lot of uh, young people with housing and uh, food needs. Another um, partner is, our, is the uh, Inner Church Food Pantry. We have a group that uh, helps there on the, uh, the, let's see, it is the third Friday of each month, 12 to 3. And that is a, a great ministry. Uh, you can help out there. They do a lot of great work uh, feeding the, the people uh, in need in the community. Uh, United Way, and I want to just draw special attention to United Way because uh, this being, well, this is the Thanksgiving season, but you know, as you all can tell from the stores, you know, it's getting to be Christmas season too. And so soon we'll be having the Christmas card out in the hallway, and uh, that is the foyer. And members can sign that, and uh, it's as though you're giving a Christmas card to everybody else in the church, and you can just sign the card, put in your donation, and uh, this year, uh, in, in some years we've had people shopping for actual gifts, but this year uh, we'll be, just be sending the donated money directly to the United Way, and that'll be, happen on December 7th, uh, and so they will make uh, purchases for uh, families in need. Uh, and if you would like to personally sponsor a family, you can do so on the United Way website, which is uwjc.org, and click on the appropriate link by November 20th. Uh, another community partner is Gateway, and on Thursdays, uh, there's a group that, that helps at Gateway, and also The Refuge, uh, a ministry up in Greenwood, and we have been collecting boxes of uh, stuffing for them and uh, leaving them at, once again out in the, uh, in the uh, foyer. And uh, we'll gather those up. They'll be putting on a big Thanksgiving uh, dinner for people in need. And you want those in by November 22nd. So there's plenty of opportunities, ways that you can serve. You know, our thing is love, grow, serve. And we... Uh, especially in this time of Thanksgiving, we want to emphasize that serving. There's a lot of great opportunities. Uh, speaking of Thanksgiving, the Thanksgiving, Johnson County Thanksgiving Banquet is coming up on Thanksgiving. That's a great way uh, if you feel like serving, especially if you're not doing anything on Thanksgiving at noon, you can help out. Or you can make a, just make a donation to them. Uh, donations can be made by cash or check sent to Johnson County Banquets Incorporated Post Office Box 207, Franklin. So, there's plenty of good ways to serve. No excuse for not doing anything. Here's a note from Dan. That is Pastor Dan. Uh, Thank you for all the notes, gifts, and prayers for Pastor Appreciation Months. Your thoughtfulness is always appreciated. Your support and care help us press on to do what God leads us to do. Thank you for all your encouragement. And uh, I just would like to uh, just make a, a note of the uh, continued uh, COVID warnings that, uh, and levels that are, uh, have been put out by the governor. I mean, we want to continue keeping our distance. If For those of you who are attending in person here, wearing masks, and just doing all you can to help us out during this time to get through the pandemic. Thank you for your cooperation for that. So as we continue our worship experience, uh, let me lead us in prayer, please. 
Dear Lord and God, we thank you for this day and for the life you give us. Help us to make each day count for you. Help us to live in grateful humility, knowing that all we have, all the abilities and blessings we enjoy, everything, including the air we breathe, is a gift from you. Help us to help others, to be a blessing to those around us, to bless others as you have blessed us. In this time of thanksgiving, let us join together in praising you for the many ways you have shown each one of us your love, though none of us has deserved it. Let that be our attitude in serving others, loving without judgment, without prejudice, without reservation. May this worship experience inspire in each of us that spirit that, as Jesus said, everyone will know you are my disciples if you love one another. It's in his precious name that we pray. Amen.
Most everyone has encountered someone who might be described as larger than life, and many try to capture and emulate the perceived qualities and behaviors we think contribute to someone's larger than life status. But what if our world and our lives become much bigger when we become appropriately smaller through the practice of humility? Humility, a modest view of our own importance. Well, how many superhero fans are out there today? I bet that we could generate some interesting discussion if we just turned everybody loose on suggesting who the greatest superhero of all time might be. My assumption is that there are some out there who would suggest that Superman was the greatest superhero of all time. After all, he's faster than a speeding bullet, more powerful than a locomotive, can leap tall buildings in a single bound, can change the course of mighty rivers, can bend steel with his bare hands, and always fights for truth, justice, and the American way. Interesting footnote, did you know that in the first installment of the comic book that Superman did not have the ability to fly? It's true. The ability to fly does not enter into Superman's powers until the second episode of the TV show, which, or the radio show, which ran in 1940. As the series develops, Superman's superpowers evolve and develop to include things like x-ray vision, projecting heat beams from his eyes, uh, the ability to hear beyond what the, the normal human ear is able to hear. He could even inhale a tremendous amount of breath and hold it for a long period of time, or he could exhale a tremendous amount of breath with immense power to change and alter the course of the surroundings around him. Another interesting footnote. Did you know that Superman had vulnerabilities and weaknesses? With all of those powers, with all of those incredible superpowers that Superman possessed, even Superman had a vulnerability and a weakness. Even Superman had an Achilles heel. The term Achilles heel comes from Greek mythology, where Achilles' mother dipped him in the river Styx, making his entire body invincible and invulnerable, except for the one location that didn't get dipped in the water because that's where she held him. And that is known as the Achilles heel, the one place in Achilles life where he was vulnerable. And Superman had a vulnerability. What was it that made Superman vulnerable? What was it that would render Superman's superpowers powerless? It was kryptonite. Exposure to the green radiation of kryptonite, which would have come from Superman's birth planet of Krypton, would render Superman's powers powerless. They would nullify his superpowers. It would incapacitate him with nausea and pain. And given enough exposure to kryptonite, Superman would eventually die. But did you know that Superman was also vulnerable to magic? It's true. According to the way the series develops, enchanted weapons and magical spells would have the same debilitating effect on Superman that it had on normal human beings. And I would suggest that Superman likely had a third vulnerability, if you want to count Lois Lane. Well, if you're wondering what all this has to do with anything, brace yourself for a couple of stark realities. Number one, none of us are Superman. And number two, it's not just superheroes like Superman who have vulnerabilities and weaknesses. All of us have vulnerabilities 
and weaknesses. There are some weaknesses and vulnerabilities that are unique to us as individuals, something that we struggle with that another person doesn't struggle with, something that is uh, that, that makes us vulnerable that doesn't make someone else vulnerable. But there are also other vulnerabilities and weaknesses that are common enough that most people, at the very least, are somewhat susceptible to them. One such vulnerability, which is commonly susceptible for all people, is pride. And this is a vulnerability that the early church leader Paul writes about in a letter to the first century church in Philippi. But fortunately, he doesn't just write about pride as a kryptonite. He actually writes about humility as a kryptonite to the kryptonite. So let's dive in to what Paul writes and see how, what we can discover about overcoming pride with beyond measure humility will make us and life bigger. Paul writes, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Well, selfish ambition and vain conceit sound like a pretty good working definition of pride. But before we get too far down the path, it might be helpful to differentiate between two different types of pride. There is a pride that is a constructive pride, and there's also pride that is destructive pride. Constructive pride is the type of pride that, that takes joy in the success of others, takes joy or pride in the completion of an accomplishment or a project. Uh, it, it's this type of joy that at the end of a project, we can step back and say, I'm proud of what I did in a positive and healthy way. It's this type of pride, constructive pride, that allows me to go and speak into my children's lives and telling them how proud I am of them for how hard they worked on a project or for how well they played in a sporting competition or for the courage that they took in engaging and connecting with a friend in a certain way or overcoming some type of a challenge. It, it is this type of pride that helps make me better and make my life better as well as those around me. But then there's also a destructive pride. And destructive pride gives us a sense of tunnel vision, so much so that everything we do and everything we see is filtered through the lens of me. Constructive pride, or destructive pride, allows us, forces us uh, to, to see everything around my interest and my needs. So simply put, destructive pride. Uh, it, when, when I have destructive pride, I tend to think of myself as better than others. And I tend to think that my needs and wants are more important than the interests of those around me. Construct destructive pride, I'll get that right eventually. Destructive pride almost always inhibits or destroys our capacity to love. And destructive pride will always impact the direction and quality of our relationships as well as the direction and quality of our lives. Fortunately, there's a litmus test for whether we have constructive pride or destructive pride, even if it is a little bit tongue in cheek. So if, you're, uh, if you have a photograph of a group that you're a part of, wh where do we tend to look first? Most of us tend to look first for us. And then we conclude that if we look good in the photo, the photo is good. 
It doesn't matter if everybody else in the photo is cross-eyed or has spinach in their teeth. As long as we look good in the photo, it's all good and we like the photo because the focus is on me rather than those around me. Fortunately, Paul paints a picture of a better path than selfish ambition and vain conceit. He writes, rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. Humility tends to get a bad rap. When we think of people who exhibit humility, we often think of people who are perceived as weak, sometimes even doormats that people just walk all over all the time, or, or people who have some type of an inferiority complex. But humility, the type of humility that Paul writes about, is not a weakness. Rather, it is strength, allowing God to be God, and allowing us to be who God created us to be. Humility isn't about thinking less of ourselves. It's just simply thinking less about ourselves. Humility doesn't lower the value of me. It simply raises the value of you. Humility doesn't ignore or neglect my interests, but considers my interests within the interests of others. The focus of humility isn't just me, it's me and those around me. Well, humility doesn't come without a catch. In fact, humility can be a little bit tricky because when I start exercising humility and realize that I'm exercising humility, it's easy for me to think, hey, I, I'm starting to become more humble. And before I know it, in my humility, pride begins to creep in about my humility. And this can be really, really tricky. One of the founders of our country, who was a pretty smart guy, understood this tension. Benjamin Franklin understood this tension. Actually, was Benjamin Franklin one of the founders of our country, or was he a little bit later? Now, take a minute to Google that and find out, and then shoot a message in the chat box and let me know if I was right on that. Anyway, here's what he said about this trickiness that's associated with humility. He said, there is perhaps none of our natural passions so hard to subdue as pride. Beat it down, stifle it, mortify it as much as one people. It is still alive. And then he goes on to say, even if I could conceive that I had completely overcome it, I would probably be proud of my humility. The tension that exists between constructive pride and destructive pride is not a problem that we will solve. It is a tension that we will have to manage because this is a vulnerability so common to many of us that we will always wrestle with it. But fortunately, we have an example to follow about the rather that Paul wrote about. He said, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. If you're a follower of Jesus, having the mindset of Jesus is required because following Jesus means doing what Jesus did. And if Jesus had a certain mindset, followers of Jesus should have that same mindset. Well, if you're connected with us today and you're not a follower of Jesus, you're off the hook. But before we get too far down that path, 
My assumption is that most of us have been around enough people filled with pride who the focus of everything in life was about them that we realize and know that people don't like being around proud people like that. So, even if you're not a follower of Jesus, if you're willing to discover the mindset that Jesus had and to be able to, to try to take steps towards implementing that same mindset into your life, you will discover that life will be better and you'll be better at life. So what was the mindset of Jesus? Paul says, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. In the original language that Paul would have written in, which was Greek, the word being is considered a circumstantial participle, which means that the translation of what it means is determined by the circumstances and the context around it. A circumstantial participle in the Greek language can take one of six different forms. But rather than to bore you with six different forms of the Greek circumstantial participle, the word being here is considered a causal circumstantial participle. As a result, the translation can be because God was, or because Jesus was in very nature God, he did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Destructive pride tends to leverage our position and privilege or really anything we can find to our own advantage. But Jesus didn't leverage his position or privilege to his own advantage for the very reason that he was in very nature God. Because Jesus was God, he chose a different approach. The approach that Paul tells us about when he writes, rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of of a servant. Now, he was in very nature God, and he took on the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. Jesus could have leveraged his position and privilege for his own advantage, but rather he chose a different path and took on the very nature of a servant. And when Jesus takes on the nature of a servant, he doesn't hide or disguise who God is. Instead, he reveals who God is, which is the most humble being in the universe, willing to consider the needs of others, willing to consider the needs of people like me, and willing to consider the needs of people like you. Jesus took on the very nature of a servant because he wanted to put action behind his mindset. And Paul says that he took even more action behind his mindset. And it says, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Sin broke and continues to break relationship between humankind and God. And Jesus, rather than leveraging his position and privilege to his own advantage, considered the needs of others, the needs of people like me and the needs of people like you, and went to great lengths to demonstrate humility and provide the path to redeem sin and to restore relationship with God for anyone 
and everyone whose relationship with God had been broken by sin and would place their trust in what Jesus had done for them that they could never do for themselves. Imagine, imagine if Jesus had only remained aware of the needs of others. Imagine if Jesus had only remained aware of the broken condition of the world because of sin. Imagine if Jesus had only remained aware of the broken condition of your life because of sin. Imagine if Jesus had only remained aware and never did anything about it. Being in very nature God, he took on the very nature of a servant to demonstrate the mindset of humility, to serve people like me and people like you. And here's one of the coolest things about following the example of Jesus. We, we don't have to be superheroes to serve others. We don't have to be a superhero to embrace and implement the superpower of humility. In fact, we, we don't even have to go very far to serve others. Because opportunities to serve others are all around us every day. We do not have to leverage our position and privilege or anything to our own advantage. Instead, we can consider our interests in the context of the interests of others. And we can follow Jesus by serving in your relationships with one another have the same mindset as Jesus what if the superpower of humility could undo and outweigh and maybe even defeat the super weakness of destructive pride in the lives of people like me and in the lives of people like you and as a result beyond measure humility will make us those around us and our world better than we might imagine possible let me pray for you as we wrap up this message dear God thank you for this letter that Paul wrote that exposes not just a, a super weakness, but also a superpower, a, a kind of kryptonite to the weakness, if you will. God, pride is such an easy thing to make part of our lives. And humility can be very, very challenging. Yet humility was the mindset of Jesus that he put into action for people that you love just as we are, but too much to leave us that way. And as each of us wrestles with our own mindset, help us to discover the impact that humility can make and help us to have the same mindset as Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you for spending this part of your day. Thank you for spending this time with us at Hurricane Community Church. And I hope and pray that it helped you take a step in relationship with God. And whether it's your first time or hundredth time, we hope it's not your last time. And we hope you'll connect with us again for part three of the Beyond Measure series. Hope. 
What do you hope for? A new house? Some new shoes? No debt? Great relationships? A good job? A change in the world's attitude? What do you hope for?